good day. And we, today we're going to be looking at um, the question of, is anyone out there? Looking at the question of Christianity and UFO, extraterrestrial life and aliens. And so let's just dive in. Have a little look. So here's um, some surveys that were carried out in 2013 on belief in extraterrestrial life by religious affiliation. Uh, you can see that at the top are uh, other and atheist slash agnostic there on the left hand side. Uh, so they're coming at top of do you believe and they're answering in the affirmative. Christianity there at the bottom and then by various denominations, Eastern Orthodoxy is the most open uh, with Baptists and other at the, the bottom end. Um, obviously with Christianity one of the big questions is around the incarnation of God having become man and so it's quite uh, earth-centered, uh, hum human-centered. Uh, the mystery of God becoming man is very centered around the question of humanity's place in the universe, which other world religions have less problem with, um, just because if there's an idea of a God out there, you know, it doesn't have to require an incarnation like Christianity does. On the 4th of November 2013, astronomers reported, based on the Kepler uh, space mission data, there could be as many as 40 billion Earth-sized planets orbiting in the habitable zones of sun-like stars and red dwarfs in the Milky Way, our own local galaxy, with 11 billion of which may be orbiting Earth-like or sun-like stars, I should say. Uh, there are thought to be between 100 billion and 200 billion galaxies in the observable universe. So just think about that for a moment. You know, 200 billion galaxies, uh, each with 11 billion sun-like stars with Earth-sized planets going around them. The mind boggles. Um, so there is a, an equation to try and work out how common life might be in the universe uh, called the Drake equation. So the number of alien civilizations in the Milky Way galaxy, uh, when you type in um, this formula, you find that it should be around about 20 civilizations in our cosmic neighborhood. So the question then is, why have we not come into contact with them if there's about 20 in our local area? Uh, wh why why haven't we come into contact with them? And this is the Fermi paradox. And so the way that's worked out is uh, the number of stars in the Milky Way, uh, the fraction of stars with possible habitable planets, um, those that might have habitable planets with life, um, how common life emerges, um, where intelligent civilizations have arisen out of just life, um, and the lifetime of civilizations, and then also the lifetimes of the stars of those civilizations as well. So one solution to the Fermi paradox is suggested in a Chinese science fiction novel, The Dark Forest, excellent book, I highly recommend it. Uh, and the author there suggests the following scenario, that all life desires to stay alive, uh, I should add that there's only a limited amount of resources. Uh, there's no way to know if other life forms can or will destroy you if given a chance. Lacking assurances, the safest option for any species is to annihilate other life forms before they have a chance to do the same to you. So here's a, a quote. Uh, the universe is a dark forest. Every civilization is an armed hunter stalking through the trees like a ghost, gently pushing aside branches that block the path, trying to tread without sound. Even breathing is done with care. The hunter has to be careful because everywhere in the forest are stealthy hunters like him. If he finds another life, another hunter, angel or a demon, a delicate infant to a tottering old man, a fairy or a demigod, there's only one thing he can do, open fire and eliminate them. It's a, it's a dark vision of the universe, uh, one which you never want to give away your, your location just because there's limited amount of resources to go around, therefore, uh, you know, annihilate others. Therefore, you've got the opportunity to have their resources. So let's jump to the, to the current headlines. Um, so this is 
May tenth, two thousand twenty-two, from um, from the New York Times. So you know this month, um, and then we've also got another one from two thousand and nineteen, which is about the the Navy pilots uh, in the the U.S. Uh, reporting uh, what they're calling UFOs or unexplained flying objects. And this was about uh, co Congress. Uh, the Pentagon reporting to Congress about um, their UFO um, research. So here's some BBC News articles as well. The US military UFO report does not confirm or rule out alien activity. So a US government report on the sightings of unidentified flying objects found no evidence of alien activity but does not rule it out officials have told the u.s media the review of 120 incidents is expected to conclude that u.s technology was not involved in most cases so here's another video from 2017 uh, now famous video released by the US fighter pilots under the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program. Uh, and here's some more sightings from, uh, from April of this year. Here's some more, I shouldn't say sightings, some more reports. Um, UFO sightings have left witnesses with radiation burns, brain damage, and perceived time suspension, according to interviews in newly released Pentagon report from 2010. Uh, they also mention uh, sexual encounters um, and unaccounted for pregnancies. Um, and this these were obtained for a freedom of information request um, to the Pentagon. OK, so these are official Pentagon documents that are now being released. So this gentleman is uh, Luz El Elizondo, the former director of the Pentagon's Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program. And he lists five observed characteristic of the craft that are now harassing uh, the US military. Number one, anti-gravity lift, that they've got no visible means of propulsion, no wings. Number two, sudden and instantaneous acceleration, the ability to survive immense G-forces. Number three, hypersonic velocities without signatures, so there's no vapor trails, no solid brooms. Number four, low observability or cloaking. Uh, and number five, transmedium travel, that they go under the water, then into the air, and then out into space. And they go through all of those um, mediums. Uh, and Lou Elizondo says that there's three options of what the craft could be. Number one, that they could be perhaps some form of secret USA sort of black op uh, project. Two, they could be perhaps Russia or China tech or three something else. And the report that was released to Congress um, is that it's not number one, it's not a black op uh, program, uh, leaving options two or three. However, sightings of the same craft have been observed and studied by the US government since the 1950s. And so they make option two less of an option. Uh, we don't think Russia or China have that sort of advanced tech, um, which leaves option number three, that it's something else. Uh, China is also taking this matter very seriously. They recently reported that they have their own UAP, um, Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon Task Force, similar to the USA, and they're using artificial intelligence to assist them. The Chinese are also trying to lead the conversation at the United Nations on this as well. So Lou Elizondo in his Washington Post interview recently said, uh, this may not necessarily be something from outer space. In fact, it could be something as natural to our very own planet as us. We're just at now at this point beginning to be technologically be able to interact and collect data. This could be something from under the oceans. This could be something from, yes, from, from outer space. We really don't know. So, you know, there's many options open. Could be extraterrestrial, could be even interdimensional. You know, we, we don't know. So let's just jump through history, just to some other reports. So in 218 BC, the Roman chronicler Livy uh, records a number of portents in the winter of this year, including phantom ships that have been seen gleaming in the sky. 
uh, in 74 BC, according to Plutarch, again a Roman historian. The Roman army, commanded by uh, Lucius, was about to begin a battle with Mithridates uh, the Sixth of Pontus when all of a sudden the sky burst asunder and a huge flame like body was seen to fall between the two armies. In shape, it was most like a wine giant, in color like molten silver. So, again, sort of semi spherical objects appearing in the sky uh, in the middle of a battle, effectively. Um, so the 14th of April, 1561, the residents of Nuremberg saw what they describe as an aerial battle, followed by the appearance of a large black triangular object and then a large crash outside of the city. The broadsheet claimed that witnesses observed hundreds of spheres, cylinders and other odd shaped objects that were moving uh, erratically overhead of the city. Uh, St. Cyril of Alexandria. Um, has a very unique way. So he's from, you know, around 376 to 444 um, AD. Unique way of interpreting the parable of the lost sheep. And he understands that the 99 sheep are various orders of rational created beings, you might call them angels, and that the one lost sheep is all of humanity. In his commentary on Luke, fragment of a sermon 21, he says this, uh, what man of you having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness, then go after the one that is lost, which he finds. And if he happens to find it, I tell you truly, he rejoices more over it than the ninety-nine that never went astray. For the multitude of rational created beings that form Christ's flock in heaven and on earth is innumerable and so great that it even mounts up to a perfect number. For this is what is meant by the term a hundred. And so the companies of the holy angels are the ninety-nine. For I've said that they are many, that the flock on earth is one and yet useful to complete the number and so sought for by Christ. Then did he seek it that was lost, all that had not yet been lost. But it's plain that what is lost is sought after. Then how had it been lost? By being brought down into sin, by wandering from the divine will and going far astray from the universal shepherd. So here's a, a very early example of perhaps a very different take on a parable than we're used to uh, from Cyril of Alexandria. He's a very well-known saint um, that the 99 are rational created beings that live in the heavens, um, but the one that has fallen, the one sheep that has gone astray is in fact humanity. In the medieval world, in uh, 1277, uh, Bishop uh, Tempier issued a condemnation of false ideas about God. And number 34 read that the first cause cannot make more than one world. So to say that God couldn't make more than one world is to deny that God is all powerful. An all powerful being can, in fact, make as many worlds as he likes. That's why he's all powerful. And so we go to the text of Scripture. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then verse 16, God made the two great lights, the larger one to govern the day and the smaller one to govern the night. And he also made the stars. So all of creation is created by and for the Lord Jesus Christ. So here's uh, the ancient medieval understanding of the world. And I think it's important just to grasp this before we look at another quote. Um, so this is the Ptolemaic system of the universe. We've got Earth at the center. And then there's all these spheres that go out from there. Um, and it's like they're glass spheres with uh, a marble set in the in the outer edge of each one, as it were, um, that's spinning around. So you've got the Earth at the center, then the moon, then Mercury, then Venus, then the sun then Mars, then Jupiter, then Saturn, then the fixed heavens, and then beyond that, the infinite, um, where God, God dwells, as it were. And you can see there in the picture on the left that the Earth is at the bottom, and it's like a skyscraper that you look up into the heavens with Saturn at the very top up there, um, and then you've got the moon at the bottom, and everything below the moon was fallen. But that which was above the moon was not fallen. OK, so this is a medieval understanding of the universe that we're it's not that we're the center, we're the bottom, we're the bottom of the pile. 
we're at the very bottom of this uh, pillar, um, you know, the dregs of the bottom of the well, as it were, um, whilst all the good stuff happens at the top. Okay, and we want to ascend to where God is, as it were. Okay, so that's the ancient understanding, the medieval understanding of the cosmos and their cosmology. Okay, and we've got a very different cosmology now, um, but that was the medieval understanding. So, uh, Nicholas of Cusa uh, writes, life as it exists on earth in the form of men, animals and plants is to be found, let us suppose, in higher forms in the solar and stellar regions. Rather than think that many stars and parts of the heavens are uninhabited and that this earth of ours alone is peopled and that with beings perhaps of an inferior type, we will suppose that in every region there are inhabitants differing in nature by rank, all owing their origin to God, who is the centre and circumference of all stellar regions. So again, another churchman writing in the Middle Ages um, about this idea that the heavens are populated. OK, uh, so C.S. Lewis in his... Um, what's sometimes referred to as the Ransom Trilogy or the Cosmic Trilogy or the Space Trilogy, um, his science fiction trilogy. Um, so his C.S. Lewis, the author of, of Narnia, um, spoke at length about this. And he tries to take some of that uh, Ptolemaic system, um, the good bits perhaps, and then reincorporate into his own system. Uh, so he has humans traveling to Mars and Venus where they encounter other um, intelligent life. Um, but these beings are all um, unfallen. They're in a state of perfection still. And in Lewis's understanding, each of the planets is ruled by like an archangel, an Uyessa. Um, and these archangels are the governors of those planets. They've been set there by God to rule over those planets um, and the life forms that exist on them. So when they go to Mars, there's the Oyesa of, of Mars, the ruler of the planet Mars. But then there's three um, intelligent species on that planet, you know, human-like, shall we put, um, uh, species with souls that are un unfallen. Um, and so in the same on Perilando on, on um, Venus, uh, there again is a human-like being, but there is also the angel who governs the planets as well. Um, and in Lewis's understanding, the angel that governs Earth, who is in charge of Earth, is the one that has fallen and Earth has fallen with him. And the Earth is the silent planet because it's, it's sort of cut off and been fortified and is in a... Um, shut down from the celestial system. Earth is gone quiet because its ruler, the Archon, the the angel in charge of it, has gone into rebellion. OK, so that's kind of Lewis's understanding there um, that the we're the silent planet because we're the only fallen one, whilst all the others are unfallen. Uh, they're still OK. And so, you know, uh, Lewis in his essay, Religion and Rocketry, says, perhaps of all the races, we only fell. Perhaps man is the only lost sheep, the one therefore whom the shepherd came to seek. And he says, I've wondered before now whether the vast astronomical distances may not be God's quarantine precautions. They prevent the spiritual infection of a fallen species from spreading. So this is Lewis's understanding that perhaps when we go out there into the universe, we're just taking sin with us. And that in fact, everything out there is pure and good. And we're actually the ones who have fallen. And the reason there's these vast distances is because we're the fallen species. Uh, so this comes to uh, one of the questions on the incarnation that I wanted to talk about. Uh, Thomas Paine, one of the, the founding fathers of the, the USA, crit critic of Christianity, uh, has the Thomas Paine problem, if we call it that, that's what Dr. Michael Heiser refers to it as, um, 
if ETs exist, they would be fallen because, you know, in the Christian story of Adam, sin affected all of creation. And if they're fallen, they would need a savior. Christ would therefore have to become incarnate on every planet, die on every planet, rise again on every planet in order to save every race. And, you know, it's just this absurd idea, perhaps, um, of, you know, Jesus, <laughs> the son of God, going from boom, 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 visiting each planet to die and rise again, you know, in so many millions or billions of worlds, you know, it, is that what happened? You know, it's, a, um, it's trying to say, you know, the idea of incarnation um, is wrong, you know, that's the idea. Uh, so um, one way of looking at this is that there's six possibilities for Christian uh, salvation in the context of other sentient life beyond earth. Number one, Jesus' death and resurrection on earth covers all beings on all worlds at all times. Number two, Jesus goes through a similar process of life, death and resurrection on innumerable planets, billions of planets to save billions of beings and creatures. Number three, the human beings as galactic missionaries, it's our purpose to colonize the universe and spread the word of God to heathen ETs. Uh, number four, that there's other mechanisms to attain salvation on other planets. Um, number five, that salvation is never offered to other beings and other creatures on other planets. Or number six, that there's no other sentient beings on other planets anywhere and the humans are utterly unique. OK, so there's a number of options that, you know, Christians could think about when thinking about the thought of Christianity and extraterrestrials and aliens. So one example from Star Trek um, is eventually the Roman Catholic Church comes to the idea and they even appoint a bishop of Kronos um, and an Andoran later becomes Pope. Um, is that a possible future, you know, where, you know, we've entered into this sort of new future where there's popes and bishops who are non-human how would they understand the incarnation and um, those sort of questions that the questions that need to be thought about so answering the thomas Paine problem are et guilty because of adam's sin so let's turn to romans 5 verse 12 when adam sinned sin entered the world adam's sin brought death and so death spread to everyone for everyone sinned i just want to dive down into this when adam sinned sin entered the world and he's talking about human sin and separation from god you have to remember that the serpent or satan had already rebelled and so there is non-human other cosmic intelligence out there where separation from God has already existed because it is already in a state of rebellion. Adam's sin brought death, separation from God's life, from the tree of life. Uh, so death spread to everyone for everyone's sin. All humans are mortal because all of us are separated from the life of God because of Adam and Eve. We all need to return back to God. So nowhere does Paul say here that because of Adam's sin, all intelligent beings are in need of a savior simply because they're not descendants of adam for one adam's sin brought death separation from god's life so death spread to everyone and the everyone here are, are humans the descendants of adam um other beings other angels or cosmic intelligences had already fallen okay so Hebrews chapter 2, verse 16, we know that the son did not come to help angels. He came to help the descendants of Abraham. So Christ's work is already limited to humans, even though other cosmic intelligences, angels already exist. No help goes to those rebellious angels because of the work of Christ. His work is uniquely for the descendants of hum humanity, for Adam. As in Adam will die, so in Christ all will be made alive, is how Paul uh, phrases it. So, from a Christian perspective, perhaps options four and five, that there's other mechanisms to attain salvation if those other cosmic beings are fallen, or well, that salvation is not offered to them. Um, a probable more probable, should we say, than Jesus going through a similar process of life, death and resurrection on innumerable billions of, say, planets and the incarnations happen billions of times on billions of different species. It's more likely to be four and five. 
So let's just go back to some of these recently released articles from April this year about sexual encounters and um, unaccounted for pregnancies that have taken place because of UFOs or aliens uh, released in those uh, Pentagon documents uh, from that Freedom of Information request. Okay, so I'm just going to go to the Snopes um, website, which is uh, a fact-checking website. Uh, it's been regarded, and this is just from Google, as well-regarded reference for sorting out myths and rumors on the internet. So this is their article on these Pentagon pregnancy um, articles. It says, De declassified Pentagon records state the people reported alien encou uh, reported encounters with UFOs that left some with unaccounted for pregnancy and radiation burns. More than a thousand pages of documents were released in April 2022 after the Sun tabloid put in a Freedom of Information Act request for the Defense Intelligence Agency, part of the U.S. Department of Defense. Now, there's a copy of one of these documents that's now unclassified. Um, of sexual encounters five were recorded okay so this is you know the mind boggles on the, some of these things so in 1991 hopkins jacobs and sociologist dr ron westrom commissioned a roper poll to order to determine how many americans might have experienced these sort of abduction phenomenon um experiences of nearly 6,000 Americans, 119 answered in a way that Hopkins interpreted as supporting a, an ET interpretation. So whether or not that's true or not. Uh, so based on this figure, he estimated that nearly 4 million Americans might have been abducted by extraterrestrials. Okay, and so in these sort of abduction reports, these are the sort of beings that are talked about. There's the Nordic aliens, um, which look like humans, but with blonde hair, blue eyes, uh, taller, stronger, more powerful than us. Um, angelic, maybe, an angelic race. Um, and then there's the greys, which are from, you know, from like Roswell and, you know, entered into, you know, more mainstream understanding of what aliens look like. And then the reptilians as well. Okay, so they're the main types of aliens that people report in these sort of things as having been abducted by or met or spoken with. So theories behind what's happening in this abduction phenomenon is that it could be some form of sleep paralysis. So the NHS describes sleep paralysis as temporary inability to move or speak that occurs when waking up or falling asleep. So you, you have sort of dreamlike experiences whilst also being in a state where you can't move your body. And so uh, you can feel like you're being abused by this entity. Uh, another theory put forward by Jack Brewer there in the Greys Have Been Framed is U.S. intelligence agencies' psychological warfare, especially in the 1950s and 60s at the height of the Cold War. Um, programs like MKUltra, mind control, experimenting on people, you know, kidnapping members of the public and doing things to them um, and then releasing them with false memories of alien abductions to see how you know, that is spread. So those sort of things. Uh, there's also, you know, as Christians, you could think of a spiritual or demonic aspect. You know, it could very well be spiritual or real aliens. And that's probably the least likely. Um, so let's just put that there as well. So just going to uh, passages that some Christians might turn to. So the book of First Enoch, chapter six, which is uh, written about 300 to 200 years before Christ. It's a book that's quoted in the New Testament in, in Jude. Um, it's a Jewish retelling of Genesis 6, and it says this, and it came to pass that when the children of men had multiplied in those days were born unto them, uh, beautiful and comely daughters. And the angels, the children of heaven, saw and lusted after them, and they said to one another, come, let us choose us wives from among the children of men and beget us children. And Shimjaza, who was their leader, said unto them, I fear you will not agree, indeed agree to do this deed, and I alone shall have to pay the penalty of a great sin. And they all answered him and said, Let us swear by an oath and all bind ourselves by mutual 
imprecations not to abandon this plan but to do this thing then they swore and they all together bound themselves by mutual imprecations upon it and they were all 200 who descended in the days of jared upon the summit of mount hermon and they called it mount hermon because they had sworn and bound themselves by mutual imprecations upon it and all the others together with them took unto themselves wives and each chose for himself one and they began to go unto them to defile themselves with them and they taught them charms enchantments the cuttings of root made themselves acquainted with plants and they became pregnant and they bore great giants whose height was three thousand ells who consumed all the acquisitions of men and when men could no longer sustain them the giants turned against them and devoured mankind and they began to sin against birds and beasts reptiles and fish to devour one another's flesh and to drink blood then the earth laid accusation against the lawless ones so you know in the the Enochian retelling of the Genesis story. That's why God then sends the flood because of all this, the sins, because of these angels breeding with humans. And then the disembodied spirits of the giants are what become demons, demonic spirits um, that Jesus encounters, etc., in the New Testament. So this is part of the Jewish worldview at the time of the Bible is that these angelic beings did descend um, and then interbred with humans which is why some christians reading the reports um, about sexual encounters about unexplained pregnancies regarding ufos and aliens uh, might then start to think about genesis 6 and first enoch and making those sorts of connections okay matthew 24 37 says as it was in the days of noah so it will be at the sun coming of the son of man so some people claim that these aliens are speaking to them. Uh, so there's a message from the designers here. So some people claim to have spoken with aliens and these people claim that the aliens have messages for humanity. An example is a new world religion called realism uh, with over 100,000 members of their, their church. Um, so humans in their belief were created by these aliens who they call the Elohim from the Bible on earth. That all is one, so there's some form of pantheism. Uh, one of the aliens is named Yahweh, who's worshipped by Christians and and Jews. The Elohim sent the messengers of Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, uh, Joseph Smith, etc. And the resurrection will come through cloning, and the humans need to become peace loving before they can be accepted, and they need a world government in one language to unite us all in peace. So these are some of the ideas that are, are entering into this sort of movement in the contactee sort of sphere. And I just want to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, verses 3 and 4, because Paul writes, but I fear that somehow your pure and undivided devotion to Christ will be corrupted, just as Eve was deceived by the cunning of the serpent. So happily put up with whatever anyone tells you, even if they... So he's accusing them, sorry. He says, you happily put up with whatever anyone tells you, even if they preach a different Jesus than the one we preach, or a different kind of spirit than the one you receive, or a different kind of gospel than the one you believed. And we shouldn't do that, okay? In Galatians chapter 1, verse 8, let God's curse fall on anyone, including us, or even an angel from heaven who preaches a different kind of good news than the one we preach to you. So this is just a, a warning to us that, particularly from sort of messages that, you know, people say that they receive from these beings or spirits, um, that if they're preaching a different form of good news, then we shouldn't believe them. Okay. Um, yeah. So just us to think about as these things become part of the broader discussion and culture. Um, so I hope hope some of the things that I've been sharing today are helpful um, and that it helps people just put into perspective some of these things. Uh, so some of the questions we need to ask is, are in fact we the only fallen race? Um, and people who claim to have spoken to aliens or UFOs often are giving an anti-gospel message and therefore we need to think about that, that are these not good spirits who are trying to deceive people in what they're saying.